there's a life cycle to developing an application and we often refer to this as the SDLC or the software development life cycle and there's different variations on this but the basic one is that an application starts with some need we believe there's a need for an application to be able to help us do something faster or more efficient or more effectively maybe than doing something manually once we figure out that need we look we assess what that program should do we often use something called an IPO chart an IPO is simply input process and output so we need to know what the input is for the problem we're going to solve maybe we want to calculate the paycheck for an employee we need to know how many hours they worked and what their hourly rate is that'd be the input and the process then is we're going to calculate the gross pay as the hours worked times the hourly rate then we're going to calculate the net pay as the gross pay minus the taxes and we're going to say it's a very simple tax structure we have and that is taxes are 23.6 percent of the gross pay so now we know what that net pay is and we can use that then for the output which is to print the paycheck if you think back to your cs 105 class we talked about hardware as having different components input such as a keyboard or a mouse or a touch screen or a microphone and then we have the processor of the computer that basically does all the work and then we have an output device usually the monitor or printer or audio speakers and in designing software it's the same thing we have input the user is going to enter some information we're going to process that information and we're going to display the results as output and pretty much every application can be boiled down to those three things in various capacities so as we start out with our learning Python we're gonna create some very simple apps that are just input process output in most cases we build an interface usually we're working with graphical user interfaces in Python we're gonna work with GUI interfaces much later on towards the end of the semester for now our interfaces are going to be uh, console based they're gonna be text based but there's still an interface in as far as providing information to the user telling them what the program is going to do and getting input from them and then also displaying that output all as text so we want to think through again what's the input what's the output and then we're going to write code and that code is going to be designed around algorithms of what do we do with that input how do we process it to get that output and there's a couple ways we do that we can use pseudocode and we'll look at that in a minute that's just simply English syntax of the steps that we would go through uh, to solve a particular problem I'm a visual learner I like to use the old school of flowcharts and then a lot of times especially as you get better with programming you can do that algorithm process simply in your head or as you write your code but I would suggest initially it's gonna be helpful probably to sit down with some paper and pencil and to write out the steps in pseudocode or to develop a flowchart once we've co coded that project then we want to test it and make sure it works and oftentimes it's not going to work even the most seasoned programmers have what we call bugs in our code and bugs are simply errors something that went wrong maybe it's a, a syntactical error it could be a logic error either way we're probably going to come back and recode our project and then retest and we might do that through several iterations so we get it to work sometimes we go back and maybe change the interface and once in a while we can go back to look at the need and what we're planning and maybe make some changes to the whole process finally though we get our code to work and it's in a state that we want to distribute it and so the next thing is to deploy it and there's lots of ways to deploy it we might put it out on the internet for people to download we might send it through email we might sell it through a store but it's a cyclical process because even if we deploy it oftentimes we'll make adjustments to that program maybe we want to add new features in the next version or as operating systems change sometimes we need to go back and change our our application as well so we arrive back at that need statement of making some changes and then go through that cycle all again and that is the software development life cycle now I mentioned algorithms an algorithm is nothing more than a, a way of representing a solution to a problem it's the steps of taking that input and coming out with desired output we use algorithms in real life such as when we want to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich 
The steps we'd follow through is to get the ingredients out, bread, peanut butter, grab a knife and jar of jelly, take the bread out of the loaf, maybe toast it, put peanut butter on one slice of bread, put jelly on another slice of bread, put those two slices together, and enjoy our sandwich. We can follow those steps and make a peanut butter jelly sandwich every time. So let's look at both pseudocode and flow charting as a way of representing those steps. So let's say we want to create an app application that just adds two numbers. And so here's our pseudocode, just English syntax that explains the step. The first step, get the first number, we're going to put it into a variable called A. Get the second number, we'll put it into a variable called B. And then we're going to add A plus B and assign it to a variable called C, and then we're going to print C. This is not code of a particular programming language, but it represents the steps, and we can then write these steps in whatever language we want to use. Same with a flowchart. A flowchart is simply a graphical representation of basically those same steps. Flowchart generally has a start symbol and a stop symbol. Those are what I call cigar shapes or elongated ovals. A parallelogram is used for input. So we're going to get our first number. We're going to assign it to A. We're going to get a second number, another input, assign it to B. Processes are represented by a rectangle. So I'm going to add A plus B, assign it to C. And then the output symbol is the same as an input symbol. Here I'm going to print C, and then my application is done. So we see arrows here connecting these symbols that represent the flow. So we refer to that stop and start symbol as a terminal symbol. Again, we have the input output symbol, which is a parallelogram. Rectangle is the internal process. And then we also have a diamond that we use for decision making, where we can fork off into two different directions. As I mentioned, we're primarily going to do input process output at least initially, very simple applications. And so here's what, how we would represent just an IPO process. Input, process, output. But as we get into things like conditions and loops, we're going to add in this diamond shape, and we're going to ask a Boolean question, which evaluates either true or false. So here I might get input, and based on that input, I'm asking a question. Maybe it's, is that an even number? And if it is, I want to do process B and print B. If it's not, if that, if that question is false, then I'm going to do process A and print output A. And so it's only going to take one or the other of these two forks. It can't do both. So I'm following this flow one way or another. And that's why we call it a flow chart. And they both end up in a stop symbol where we conclude our application. So let's take a problem of finding the prime factors of a number. So 8 is represented as 1 times 2 times 2. 63 is 1 times 3 times 3 times 7. So 9 times 7 gives us 63. 30 can be represented as 1 times 2 times 3 times 5. And 17 is a prime number. Any prime number is only represented by 1 and itself. So 17 is 1 times 17. We want to create an application that we will have the user enter a number such as 8 or 63 or 30 or 17 and have it display what those prime factors are, and maybe in the case of a prime number, tell us that it's prime. So I can write out those steps as pseudocode. We're going to get a number. We're going to assign it to a variable called num. If num does not equal 0, make sure it's a positive integer, we're going to do the following. So everything here that's indented is part of this if structure. We're going to create an output string in which we're going to take whatever number they specify and say it equals 1. It's going to be the beginning of our string. That's this 8 equals 1 or 63 equals 1. We're going to set a Boolean variable called prime to true, and we're going to use that to determine whether this is a prime number or not. We're going to assign the num value to a second variable called new num. And that's so we can reserve our num value. Then I'm going to loop through the numbers from 2 to new num. And I'm going to assign through that loop each number in that range to a variable called i. And if that new num is evenly divisible by i, then I'm going to set prime to false, meaning we now have another number besides 1 and itself that is one of the prime factors. So it's no longer a prime number. So we set prime to false. I'm going to reassign new num now to new num divided by i. And I'm going to add x and the value of i to the output string. 
So in the case of 8, we had our initial output string of 8 equals 1. And here I'm going to add the x and the 2 through the loop. Now, I'm going to come back through here and check to see if new num is still evenly divisible by i. And if it is, I'm going to add a second 2. If it's not, I'm going to move on to the next number. So the next number will be 3. So in the case of 63, I have 1 times and 2, or 63 is not divisible by 2. So it never does this by adding the x2, but it is divisible by 3. It's divisible by 3 2 times. So I get 63 equals 1 times 3 times 3. And eventually we go on to 7. Now in this loop, it's going to be easiest in this loop to go through all the numbers. And 4 and 6 would never come up because we've already examined 2s. And 4 is divisible by 2, and 6 is divisible by 2, and 3. So those values would never have come up in terms of being evenly divisible. This is going to bypass those. Once we've gone through the, through the loop, we're going to ask if prime is true. And if it is, we're going to add an x and the number, in this case, 1 times 17, because none of this took place. And then we're going to print the output string. So maybe it's going to be 60 equals 1 times 2 times 3 times 5. They're going to keep adding or entering new numbers. And as long as it doesn't equal 0, it goes through this process. But if they put in a number that's 0, so if num equals 0, we're going to print goodbye and exit the program. So those are the English-like steps we're going to go through. We have to convert into code. And we're going to do that in the next video. But let me also show you the flowchart for that finding prime factors. This is the same thing represented graphically. Now whether you use pseudocode or flowchart or even just be able to do this in your head is doesn't really matter. Choose whichever method works best for you. I'm going to suggest initially you'll want to use either uh, pseudocode or flowcharting. And this is also a great way to explain the process to somebody else. As a systems analyst or maybe overseeing a project you could develop the pseudocode and, or the flowchart and hand it off to somebody else to write the code. Another coworker would write the code. So in the next video, we're going to create this project in Python.